Ladies and gentlemen, Keith Chillin here, and I'm back with another TheMMATakeover.com special edition. Today's guest is one of the biggest names in both the sport of MMA and amateur wrestling. He had a legendary 14-year MMA career with an overall record of 22-9. and nine. He has fought in the UFC, Strike Force, Affliction, IFL, and several other uh, organizations. He was a civil medalist in the 2000 Sydney Olympics in Greco-Roman wrestling and is currently the head coach of UFC Wrestling National Greco-Roman Team. Ladies and gentlemen, Matt the Law Lindland. Matt, how are you? Steve, I'm doing great. Thanks. Uh, we really appreciate you com coming on. All the listeners really appreciate taking your time out of your schedule to be with us. Uh, the first thing we always get to, we'd like to ask people because everyone has such a different way they got into it is how did you get into mixed martial arts? How did I? Well, I was uh, I was a competitive uh, wrestler, and uh, my highest uh, performance has been uh, silver medals in the world championships and Olympic games. Uh, I competed in Olympic games in Sydney, Australia, in 2000, and uh, that was in October. In December, I was fighting in the UFC. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, wow. I, uh, I had some I had some other friends that were uh, that were currently fighting, Randy Couture, and uh, I moved back to my hometown, and he was living there, and so we started training together now obviously one thing when you talk about matt linden is not only your fighting career but also the the aspect you had of between you dan henderson uh randy couture and the legendary team quest um you got all these big name teams right now american top team aka all these things but team quest was one of the biggest and one of the earliest teams tell us how that all came along well, I think you just had uh, some guys that were, were wrestling. We got together and started training in martial arts and uh, attracted some other fighters that wanted to uh, study with us and train with us. And, you know, it was uh, quite an effort. You know, I mean, I, I built a, I built a gym business around that. I started promoting fights with Randy, uh, with, known as Sport Fight. We were one of the, the largest, most successful regional events in the country. And, uh we, uh, you know, so we give our athletes opportunities and, and a venue to fight in, as well as, uh, you know, manage the careers of a lot of these younger, younger athletes. And a lot of the fighters started rolling into you guys, like Evan Tanner came to you guys, I think Jeff Munson was in your team, Chael Sonnen, uh, anybody else I'm forgetting about? Well, yeah, there's a, there was a lot of, a lot of guys that were, were veteran types guys that, that trained with us. I mean, Jeff Monson and Dennis Hallman, Benji Raddick, they were all, you know, neighbors of ours and we, we trained together. They spent a lot of time in my gym. I also traveled to train with those guys up in Olympia, Washington. You know, Yushin Okami, after he yeah. fought one of my students, uh, came out and started training with us on a consistent basis. I've trained DJ Penn for a few of his big fights and, I mean, you name it, the guys have come out and trained with us from, you know, Chuck Liddell to Rico Rodriguez to, I mean. The who's uh, who. And the list goes, list goes on and on. Boss Root, Ken Shamrock, uh, Don Fry. I mean, I, I know I'm going to forget a lot of names of guys that have, you know, came out and, and wanted to train at our facility and, and work. You know, it's. In the early days of MMA, you know, I, I traveled a lot of places. I went to American Top Team. I went to AKA. I went to the Pit. I went to as many, you know, facilities as I could. I trained with uh, Matt Hume and, and uh, Maurice Smith. And, you know, the guys that really laid the groundwork for this sport, I wanted to I yep. wanted to know what they knew, and I wanted to study with them and improve my skills. So I, I think that was just the way things were done in, in that time. Uh Nobody was a was a complete fighter, you know. We all had our our specific backgrounds, and I think the best thing to do at, at that point was to share all that knowledge and and work with one another. Um, so one thing you you mentioned you mentioned you used to coach uh, B J Penn in so many fights. One of the things as soon as you said that drove me to the moment when B J Penn fought George St Pierre the first time in a very close fight, very controversial fight. And uh, George St Pierre, I believe it was a split decision. He ended up winning. I remember you saying, "Look at his face!" <laughs> like that. I, I always remember that moment. Well, it, well, it was. I mean, BJ did beat him up uh, and, and won the fight. The the judges saw BJ's back against the cage, which we talked about. But he's very comfortable in that position. But it, the optics of that for the judges, if it doesn't go, if it goes to a decision, the judges are looking at your back against the cage the same as your back against the mat. In my opinion. You know, they're not as well-educated on the sport as the fighters and the coaches. So, yeah. 
you know, they just have to go off of optics, what it, what it looks like. And when you have your back up against the, the, fa- the fence there and you're, you're still winning the fight, it, you know, it may not, the perception may not be the same to the judges. So I think that was one of the, one of the errors that we made in that fight was, you know, we allowed BJ to fight off of, off of the cage, although he was doing all the damage. Yeah. The optics didn't, didn't look that good, but you know, the other performance I, I coached him for was the, the, the uh, Matt Hughes fight when he choked him out in about oh, I think it was like a minute and a half, yeah. double underhooks on the one that one that BJ foot, Penn won. Foot propped him and took his back. Yeah, UFC uh, I believe it was forty six. That was one of the uh, still one of the biggest upsets in the history of MMA. I mean that was a that was a huge moment in uh, in mixed martial arts. Now, yeah, well, well BJ BJ had reached out to me and wanted me to be his wrestling coach, and I I absolutely refused to be his wrestling coach. I said I would I would coach him, but but I needed to run the, the camp because I think there's there's too many conflicts of interest when you have, you know, different coaches, different, you know, for each skill set. It's uh, You need one guy that's going to be the head coach and he's going to lay the strategy and the game plan because you, you have you have kickboxers that want, you know, they want their athlete to knock the guy out. You have jiu-jitsu guys that want to see submissions and, you know, maybe wrestlers wants to see you control the, the takedowns and the top positions. I You know, I want the coach to be the to help him win that fight, and uh, so I told him that you know the only way I was going to help him if I was going to run the camp. I didn't want to just be one of the one of the random you know skill coaches that he wanted. Now you mentioned you've trained with so many guys, you've uh, coached so many guys. Do you steep, and now you've you're no longer in a mixed martial arts. You're in the wrestling, amateur wrestling world. Uh, do you still well, keep I was in touch with those guys? With Henry Cejudo this week, so I mean, I, oh, okay. I still, I still got, I still got my toes in the water. Um, you know, but guys have to come out to me here in Colorado Springs at the Olympic Training Center, and and I, I'm happy to work with guys and, and share my my knowledge and, mm-hmm. and uh, help them along the ways. But yeah, I, I've uh, I've got a pretty pretty busy job uh, now coaching and leading the U.S. Greco Roman team. So uh, let, let me ask this question back up a little bit. How did you get the nickname, The Law? How did I get the nickname, The Law? You're not familiar with that story, huh? I, I um, No, I'm not. I'm sure that they've said it at, well, at the in, early years. Well, in the UFC's. 2011 trials, uh, my, my final match was misjudged. Um, and it, was, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't close. It was the equivalent to uh, a ball being hit in the middle of bleachers in the center field. Uh, you know, and, and, okay. the, and the referee calling it a foul ball. Um, so, you know, I, I went through the the proper procedures and channels, which is, uh, you know, appeal to your sport committee and then arbitrate the case. And, you know, along the way, the organization, uh, you know, kept messing up the process, uh, did, did not give me my, my due process and my rights along the way. And, and finally, a... Uh, an arbitrator ordered a, a rematch. I beat the opponent nine to zero. Ten, ten to zero is, is a, you know, in, in MMA they would call that a knockout or a, or a uh, you know, tech fall the fight at, at, at ten points in, in wrestling. But I scored nine nine points. He scored zero. It was a clear victory, uh, and I was still I was still kept off of the uh, Olympic team at that time. And and like I said, I, I appealed the process. Fully, and uh, and finally, it, it, it ended up in the hands of the U.S. Supreme Court, and uh, wow, I didn't you know, ended up this. going to going to the Olympic Games and representing the United States. But you know, I, I had to fight for that right, and not just on the mats, but you know, where I had a nine zero uh, victory, but but in the courtroom as well. And that was the same Olympics that you went away to the uh, gold medal match and take the silver medal, right? Yeah. So I mean, it, it really made no sense to send any other athlete to the games because we didn't have anybody in our country that was capable of, you know, beating the, beating the rest of the guys in the world, the Russians, the, the Georgians, the Ukrainians, the, yeah. you know, along the way. Now you've, you go through your career, you have some legendary wins. You've fought your entire career. You fought a who's who. Is there a one win or one accomplishment you're most proud of? Oh, well, I, I tell you, I think, uh, Probably my my favorite early win was against a gentleman named Pat Militich. Yeah, yeah, he was of course. somebody that's uh, a legend in the sport. Yeah, uh, somebody that I respect a ton. That uh, was very skilled. He was a world champion, yeah. and uh, you know I, I got the opportunity to fight Pat. I think it was ooh, my third fight, third or fourth fight in the UFC. 
I probably wasn't ready for that caliber of a fight, uh, and I, I prepared well, and I, I came away with a with an impressive victory. And uh, you know, going back to guys that I've trained with, Pat Milicic was a was a guy that I regularly visited out out in Iowa after that fight. Uh, we our relationship grew, and we became bigger, you know, better friends, and we started training together more often. Now you've fought so many guys and Pat Millich is obviously a huge name. He's a, like you mentioned, he was a former UFC, uh, welterweight champion. Uh, he's obviously he ran the military fighting system for years, which is another legendary team. He's obviously now he's turned over into commentating, doing all the commentating for access, uh, fights. Um, so that was a huge win. Now I just want to run down some of the names of the guys that you fought. Cause, cause sometimes we have a lot of newer listeners that might not know, uh, who you are. Um, this this guy has fought a who's who of 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 fighters. I mean, he's fought Ricardo Almeida, Phil Baroni, Pat Militich, Marilla Bustamante, Travis Luter, Quentin Rampage Jackson, Jeremy Horn, Carlos Newton, Fedor Emelianenko, Vitor Belfort, Jacare Souza, Robbie Lola, and so many more that I'm leaving off the list for us for time per- periods. Is so you have fought so many legendary guys. Is there one guy you didn't get a chance to fight that you wish you could have? Sakuraba. Uh, really? On two, on two occasions. On two occasions, I was, I, uh, I got a, I got a late, uh, last minute offer to fight him. I, one time I was, I was literally in Japan when I got the call, and uh, I was ready to take that fight on two separate occasions. And tried, uh, they, they did not book that fight. They, they found lesser opponents for Sakuraba both times. It's funny because me, me and uh, my partner here, we always. Every time we interview a legend, obviously I do this big rundown like I just did naming the fighters. I did it with uh, Guy Mesger. I've done it with Mark Coleman. I've done it with um, Jeff Munson. And we always try to guess who they're going to say. And and I guess for you, I, I guess it was going to be Anderson Silva because there was a time where you guys weren't ranked. It was going to be who? I thought it was going to be Anderson Silva. There was a time where you were both ranked one and two in the world. And unfortunately, you well, weren't. Well, you know, I tried, I tried to make that fight happen against Anderson uh, a few different occasions. Once, once when we were both out of the UFC. And uh, I, I actually had that fight booked. But in my contract with, uh, with the guys in London, I had, a, I had an exemption that said if I got offered a, a fight for more money, because I was willing to take that fight for very cheap money. And uh, just, to, just to get the fight... Uh-huh. But I, I I got an offer to fight Van Arsdale for twice the money, okay. and I just asked them to match that offer, and they they weren't capable of doing it. So I ended up taking the fight against Van Arsdale. We tried to I tried to schedule it again. I guess fights when you said legends. I mean, you know, I mean, Sakurab is the guy that probably popped in my head the sure. first. But yeah, I would have loved I would have loved to fight. Uh, Anderson Silva, you know, I tried to fight Rich Franklin. I tried to fight Matt Hughes. I mean, yeah. you name it. I, you know, I even offered to cut down to welterweight to fight Hughes, wow. uh, which I didn't want to do. And you know, you see me move up to middle uh, from middleweight to light heavyweight to, to take on guys like Rampage. Moved up to heavyweight to fight Fedor, Fedor yep. When I was the number one ranked middleweight in the world, he's the number one ranked heavyweight in the world. So you know, moving up or moving down a weight, it, it, it's prize fighting. So I was willing to fight for the biggest prize wherever that was sure but yeah some of those fights for for promotional reasons probably just didn't happen so you just mentioned your fight with Fedor. I wasn't planning on doing this but uh now that you brought it up I might as well um I've always had a a bone to pick with that fight and and I I think you know exactly where I'm going to go with this you went over and fought Fedor who at the time was ranked the number one heavyweight he's obviously a legendary fighter he's probably considered by most people the greatest heavyweight ever he's probably on the uh, mount rushmore of of fighters you jump up two weight classes i believe the fight was in russia you fought him and there's a controversial part and i know you know exactly where i'm going to this you immediately caught him you get into the clinch where obviously that's your world greco-roman uh, silver medalist you start going for, to take him down. You, you got an inside trip. You're trying to take him down. He grabs the ropes. He grabs the ropes. He grabs the ropes. Every single time he you grabs the ropes, twelve times in that fight. And, and then uh, eventually, when he, you're he you actually he wasn't even he wasn't even assessed a, a penalty point at any one of those times. Okay, but you lift I him. I was fighting in Russia. I've I've fought all over the world against against Russians and Georgians and I mean Turks and <laughs> everywhere in the world. I I understand when you're fighting in somebody else's country, maybe the calls aren't going to go your way for sure. 
Okay. This, yeah, I wanted to ask you if you felt cheated because at, at one point he ends up getting on the top position because you actually lift him in completely off the mat. His feet are off the air. And he grabs the ropes and then he kind of hip tosses holding the ropes to get the top position. And obviously, Fedor, he's got a size advantage. He's and I'm not trying to take anything away from Fedor. I mean, his resume speaks for itself. Yeah, I'm not trying. Like I'm saying, I'm not trying to bash Fedor. I mean, his 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 resume speaks for himself. But I just want to say, you you definitely do feel like you were cheated in that match. And I know I know you're not one. Well, you're... I I I've never I've never claimed I was cheated. Okay. I mean, it's 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 fighting and things things happen in in that sport. And uh, you know, I mean, look at look at my fight against Rampage Jackson. That was it was a clear victory on should have been a clear victory on everybody's card. Yeah. You know, I quite you know potentially could have won all three rounds. I definitely won two of the three rounds. And somehow he walks away with the decision because he was the poster guy that they wanted to promote in that organization. It's, you know, there's, there's things that go on in this business that, uh, you know, the fans don't always see. Uh -huh. um, one thing I want to mention this, I wasn't going to say this, I was actually going to mention this off, um, off air, but I know you're not expecting this. Um, one of the reasons why I'm really compassionate, you know, I really I should say really passionate about you winning that fight is is I've actually had two interactions with you and and you don't know this. Um I was I was in the army in 2004 and at that time I was kind of um I kind of anyways, I was reaching out I was trying to reach out to people and I I actually uh messaged you in an email and you actually responded back to me. We actually we actually talked through email for over several weeks so i was like wow man that's so cool because i messaged a couple of fighters and you actually the only one who messaged me back and i remember that and the other um time that i had an interaction with you and you're definitely not gonna remember this um you and dan henderson were in an ifl this is probably if i had to guess 2005 2006 um and you're an ifl in mohegan in mohegan sun in connecticut and before the fights happened the main event was henzo gracie versus carlos newton and you and Dan Henderson were walking through the uh, casino, and 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 mixed martial arts wasn't as popular then as what it is now. And right away, I saw you and Dan Henderson, two legends of the sport. Me and my wife, I um, talked to you, and you guys talked to me and my wife. Um, and, and slowly over time, a little bit of bigger crowd came around. But you talked to me and my wife for at least fifteen minutes, and it didn't seem just like okay, I gotta talk to people. You guys like generally, you took pictures with us. You seemed like you were actually enjoying talking to us. Um, I'm sure you've probably had tons of trans interactions with that. But that's why I've always been a Matt Lindland fan. I remember those two times. Um, so from well, I've well, never I done this before. I've never done this before, but I really there's, appreciate there's been that. Times where where uh, I recall when I think it was at the Mohican Sun. Uh, when Randy fought, uh, oh, who, who busted his eye open? Was that Rico Rodriguez that busted his eye open and he had to have surgery? And cause I remember. Well, he's had I his eye busted a couple. I think you're thinking of the uh, Josh Barnett one. Yeah, uh, a straight elbow in the eye. Maybe that was Barnett uh, in Mohican Sun where he fought Barnett. Yeah. And uh, we needed to get him to the hospital. I was looking for his wife and his his mother and. And I, I was criticized because I didn't engage the fans when I was trying to find his wife and his mother, um, so they could join him in the ambulance to the hospital. Uh -huh. And so I, I recall that. So it wasn't that time. <laughs> no, it wasn't that. It was an IFL show. Um, and you guys actually after that, you and Dan and I think Bass Rutten and Don Fry and a bunch of other guys and Ken Shamrock, we were all signing autographs for everybody. But I kind of got the exclusive access beforehand because me and my wife decided we we're gonna go up early and, and have dinner and 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 then we run into two legends of the sport. And obviously, I was in like you know cloud nine. Did you, before did you I was ever doing eat the media. dinner at that at that Michael Jordan Steakhouse there at the Mohican Sun? No, yeah, I, 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 I think we were eating. Oh, that, that's one of the best steakhouses I've ever eaten at. All right. So I, I know most people probably don't want to hear me uh, talk talk the air off about my experience with you, but I just want just from the bottom of my heart, I really appreciated uh, that that time. Um, so you well, you've, you. you mentioned that you have like fought all over the world. You fought in England. You fought in, obviously in, all across America. You fought in Hawaii, Russia, Poland, all kinds of. Is there any place that you really? Was, what was the coolest place that you got to fight at? Oh boy. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I've enjoyed all those venues. You know, I've, I've, uh, I've been blessed enough to travel my whole life, uh, uh, you know, as a, as a wrestler and, and then also as a, as a mixed martial arts fighter. Um, countries I like, I mean, I, I love Eastern Europe for some reason. Uh -huh. I think it's a, it's a 
great place. I mean, there's a lot of rich history all over Eastern Europe. Um, Poland, I, I've uh, I've actually competed in that city before, Gdansk, and, and uh, before I was fighting, there's a there's a little town about oh 50 miles south of there called Wadasovovo on the Baltic Sea that's just absolutely gorgeous. So I, I don't know. I mean, there's there's millions of places in this world that are that are fun to experience and exciting. I just got to experience Mongolia for the first time this year. Uh-huh. I've uh, never been to Chile until last year. I got to, uh, my wife and I just spent our 25th anniversary in Costa Rica, which was an incredible place to, to visit. So I don't know if I have a, an absolute favorite place. Uh, fighting uh, Fedor in, in St. Petersburg, uh, Russia, was, was a pretty incredible experience. And, and not only, you know, the opportunity to fight uh, Fedor, which was to go have dinner with uh Putin in the uh, presidential palace afterwards was pretty, oh, wow. pretty surreal experience as well. Yeah, that is surreal. So, um, how how was Putin? Was Putin cool? He was cool. Yeah, cool as hell. Yeah, I like the guy. Oh, um, yeah, he. I guess he's very fluent in English, but uh, uh, prefers to go through interpreters because it it shows weakness if he if he doesn't speak Russian. Mm-hmm. He feels that that's a uh, that's a sign of weakness. So he'll he'll always speak Russian when whenever he's in public and okay. use translators. But uh, uh, according to my sources, he's very fluent in English. Oh. So, oh. so you retired um, just over five years ago, or actually almost going on six years ago now. When did you know it was time to, to hang it up? Ah, oh, shoot! <laughs> I. Uh, Probably that last fight where I, I was just I was just too slow, you know. I wasn't I wasn't reacting as fast as I was before. Maybe even the fight before that when I when I fought Robbie Lawler, um, was, you know, maybe a decade younger than I am. So uh, I think I think just the the years of combat of sports, you know, take a toll on your body. And I want to keep I want to keep my brains intact. Uh, for the rest of my life, so I, I decided to step away from the sport. Now you've been, you know, you weren't in the very early stages of of the UFC with the no rule, you know, the no rules and the multiple guys. Well, I, uh, my first three fights, there were three rules. There were uh, no biting, no eye gouging, and uh, no groin attacks. Uh-huh. My first UFC was still under the SEG banner. Yeah. Um, my second fight, they was uh, against in the UFC was against Ricardo Almeida, which was the first time they took out uh, kicks to a downed opponent. Yeah. Um, so so I was I was right there when they were adding rules and, and changing rules up. And I remember my my UFC fight against Yoji Anjo, where he shot in and I front headlocked him and, and kneed him in the face a whole bunch of times, and we were mm-hmm. we were both you know technically grounded fighters. So. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've been uh, I've been around long enough to see a lot of the changes. How do you do you like the changes of the sport, or did you like it back when you first started? Well, I, I like uh, as a competitor, the less rules the better. Um, really? Well, yeah, I think it's it's more realistic okay. for sure. Um, you can you know, you can employ. I mean, you can play a lot of different strategies and tactics. Uh, you know, based on the rule sets, and you know, the less rules there there are, the you know, the less tactics. It's just more about the fight, and, and that's why I got into the sport. I didn't get into the sport to get rich or get famous. I got into the sport to to compete against uh-huh. some of the best guys in the world in martial arts, and and that you know, it's over the years. I think with the rule changes and and the the promotion, the marketing, it's become more about you know showmanship and promoting and marketing um, instead of true competition. Yeah. It's funny. It's something about wrestlers who wrestle at a high level that just they kind of give the same answer because we recently interviewed Jeff Munson and we recently interviewed Mark Coleman and they both said the same thing that they got in this sport not to make money but to just to con- continue to compete and to test themselves. It's something about that grinding uh, wrestler mentality. Now, when you when you first started in the sport, did you ever think it would go, grow to the popularity that it is today? Yeah, I, I mean, personally, I, I thought, wow, this is a great sport. It, sh- it should already be bigger than it is. Uh-huh. Um, and I and I think it's 
it's getting to a point where I think the, um, you know, it is as popular as I think, you know, it, it could have been. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I still think there's a lot of people that just aren't interested in, in martial arts and the, you know, but I think there's quite a few that are now that it's been exposed mm-hmm. and people have seen what it is. I mean, personally, I, I'm not a fan of a lot of sports. There's just not a lot of things on, you know, that I would, I would want to watch, you know, there's, there's certain events like I, I would never watch a basketball game on TV, but if I, if I'm in Portland and I got some course side seats, I'm going to go watch a game. I just, I just did over Christmas. I took my, my dad to a blazer game, but, uh, did I enjoy the, the, the game or just more the experience? Probably more the experience, you know, sitting down on the floor and, you know, sharing that with my father. I think it was a, it was a great experience. But as far as the sport, I mean, eh, I could take her or leave it. Yeah. You- and I, I, and I'm, I'm like that with most sports. I, I, uh, I appreciate combative athletic sports. I, I appreciate uh, equestrian events and, uh, and whitewater; those are some of my my favorite sports. But anything outside of that, I'm, I could probably take it or leave it. I I don't have TV, so I don't watch sports on okay. TV. Okay, so you're not going to be watching the Super Bowl? Uh, no, no. I, I you know unless I get invited to a party or something. I'll, yeah. And and typically I don't even watch it. I socialize and yeah. eat the good food. Well, we'll have a we'll have a Super Bowl party here. If you want to fly all the way to Rhode Island, you're more than welcome to come. The only thing is, we're all we're all Patriots fans out here, so you'd have to root for the Patriots. Okay, okay. Well, who's in who's in the Super Bowl? Oh. The Patriots are playing. Yeah, the Patriots are in the Super Bowl. Yes, they're 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 okay. They're facing well, the follow, Atlanta Falcons. Okay. I don't I don't follow the sports pages. I follow the politics a little more. Uh-huh. Uh, so there's a lot going on right now in the world with. Uh, with a new president and a bunch of new executive orders, so I've kind of been caught up in that. You know, yeah. anytime I have time sure. to to read for fun. Yeah, I'd like to give you a follow up question, but I don't follow it enough to to. I do the opposite. I I, I follow the sports, especially mixed martial arts. I don't follow the politics. I I couldn't give you a follow up question on that. So let me ask you this question. You you talked about obviously the sport growing so big. Um, have you experienced any personal like more recognition now? Because of the growth of the sport, like has new, you know, there's been a new fans, you know, Ronda Rousey, Conor McGregor, they brought in a whole new uh, of avenue of fans. Have, have these people recognized you for all the things you've done in the sport? Oh, I think so. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people that, have, you know, would, you know, especially young up and coming fighters for sure. They they've studied the history of the sport, but I think a lot of the fans have as well. Okay, so um, we're gonna transition. Um, we always do this one thing. Uh, this is actually backed by popular demand. We do this thing called the fan forum question of the week, and I'm not gonna lie, we kind of cheated on this one a little bit because um, I love this question and I love the responses from the legend. So I uh, we're actually using a repeat question. Uh, this one comes from T-shirt Kurt is his name. He's from Florida. Uh, his question is, what is the craziest backstage story you have? Oh, I got a great backstage. Oh, I've got a bunch of them, but uh, take tell as many as you probably, want. I love them. <laughs> well, there's probably some that that shouldn't be aired, but I think probably the craziest backstage story I, I ever I ever saw was uh, when Crazy Horse knocked out uh, Vanderlei Silva before you, Vanderlei fought Ricardo Arona. Really? So you saw it happen? That, yes. Wow. I witnessed the whole thing. Yeah, I was sitting right in the warm up area. Well that that's and uh somebody did have a tape of that at some point. Yeah. I don't know. I know the Japanese were, were ripping tapes uh, uh from from everybody that had a uh, it was kinda of right before phone cameras too. So the people that had them had them on, on the video cameras. Uh-huh. You know, phone cameras haven't been around, it seems like they have forever, but they really haven't been around that long. Um but yeah, that was that was a pretty interesting story. <laughs> when I saw when I saw Crazy Horse jump up after he just got kicked by Vanderlei and knock him out cold. Well, and that, then he went out and fought Ricardo Ricardo Arona after that. That was that was a pretty good story. Well, that that is actually uh, that's really um, crazy story because. That is a big controversy. I don't know if I mean it happened years ago, or it was rumored to happen years ago. There was some video, and 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 Vanellie Silva denied that that happened, and Charles Bennett has continued to say it has happened. You know, it's happened, and then just recently, in Rising, it sparked up again with Charles Bennett came back on the scene in Rising. Obviously, Vanellie Silva's over there. The big 
dispute. They is, actually, is, uh, is Crazy Horse back? He's fighting again? Yeah, yeah. He fought in uh, he fought in Rise and he won in, uh, I think, like a seven or eight second knock, he, knockout. We actually um, had him scheduled for a guest. And then, unfortunately, um, we had to reschedule. We're hoping to get him in soon. Um, but, yeah, that was actually one of the things that he sparked up. He called out Vandalay. He's like, you know, I knocked you out. And, of course, Vandalay's like, where's the video? It didn't happen. So uh, Matt, Lillen is on, <laughs> Matt Lillen is on Charles Crazy Horse Bennett's um, side saying that it did happen. Uh, well, I mean, it, it's, I witnessed it. <laughs> I mean, I saw it with my own eyes. Uh, you know, there was a, there was a triangle choke. Uh, Bennett was out. He was unconscious. He woke up. Uh, started to come after Vanderlei. Vanderlei kicked him and knocked him back down. Uh-huh. And he just bounced up and threw a right hook and it landed. Yeah, the the story... <laughs> that was it. That's that's it. That's wow. all that happened. Wow, the story that Charles Bennett told that basically he said he fought. I don't forget, I don't remember who he fought that day. He ended up fighting. Um, he had some bad... Well, he had already fought. Yeah, yeah Charles he, Bennett fought. He had already fought and... and, and uh, the main event was, like I said, Arona and Vanderlei. Yeah. So this happened about two, three fights before the main event. Yeah. So so Charles Bennett tells a story that he yeah he fought. Um, he's had he had some beef with the whole Shootbox Academy team. Uh, their Brazilian jiu-jitsu coach Christian Marcelo kind of confronts him. You see that on video. Next minute, you see them going at it. Charles Bennett t- gets on top, landing some good shots. Christian yeah, chokes, chokes him out. Christian chokes him out. You see was, that in the video. And then his, I can't remember, I'm, I might be a little uh, cloudy on this. He says that after that, he got up and he just busted <laughs> he busted Vandalay in the face and then he got chased out by, like, the entire shootbox team. Yeah, that, that's that's how it happened. He got wow. choked out with a triangle by by some jiu-jitsu coach. Yeah, Christian Marcelo, and, yeah. Then, and then he started to get up and Vandalay kicked him, like, just like a little push kick, like, get the hell out of here and... And then he bounced up and landed a right hand. It wow. was it was that. That's it. Wow. So uh, and that was pretty crazy. That's a crazy backstage. That story. is a crazy, especially considering at the time, um, Vanellope Silva was the top, or at least considered one of the top two hundred five punters on the planet. Um, and and Charles Bennett is about what one fifty five, I believe. Um, so, yeah. So let's transition to what you're doing now. Um, obviously, it's I'm sure this is you consider this a very big accomplishment. You were just recently named the uh, U.S. National Greco uh, Roaming Head Coach. Um, how did that all come along? Well, uh, well, how did that come along? I was I I'd, uh, retired from the sport and uh, just kind of retired for a couple of years, and I was uh, doing a lot of fishing and doing a lot of kayaking and, and whitewater rafting. And I uh, started getting back involved with USA Wrestling as a volunteer coach. I was, I was also coaching at my alma mater, Clackamas Community College, where we won national titles. Uh, actually, they just won they just won their fourth one this year in a row. Uh, so the first two were I was there, part of that that staff, and then the next the next two I, I've been here. But um, I started volunteering coaching for for USA Wrestling. I could. I could kind of see that they were looking in, in a new direction as a as a head for a head coach, and uh, when the the opportunity came available, organization reached out and I applied, and that's that's kind of what happened. And uh, <laughs> I moved out to Colorado. Uh, I, I I doubt I would have done this uh, t- taken this position or this role uh, earlier in my career when my my kids were still. You know, in my house growing up, but my my youngest had, had been in college now for for a couple of years when I took that role, and uh-huh. so uh, yeah, the timing was was good. They needed a new coach. I I love the uh, the sport, the competitive aspect of the sport. I want to see the United States uh, get back to you know being the top country in the world, and um, that's it, man. I I started coaching wrestling again. Now, you know, a lot of College wrestlers, a lot of world class wrestlers going to the Olympics. A lot of them transition over to mixed martial arts. Uh, you mentioned Henry Cejudo, who was obviously an Olympic gold medalist. He's now one of the top uh, fighters in the entire UFC. Has any of these fighters that you're cur- I mean, sorry, any of these wrestlers that you're currently coaching, has any of them reached out to you about, hey, mixed martial arts, should I do it? Anything like that? Well, we've had a few guys. Uh, J. Rod Trice just uh, switched over. Tyrell Fortune, who I mentioned, yeah. Clackamas Community College. I coached yeah. him when he was at Clackamas. 
Um, he, was, he was a freestyle wrestler, but uh, a lot of these guys are, are starting to switch over. We saw Ed Ruth make a transition. Yeah, he was on a world team back in 2013 in Hungary uh, for freestyle. And, you know, I think I think it's a it's a great avenue for for a lot of these wrestlers. But some of the guys that I've got right now, hopefully, they don't want to make a switch before yeah, uh, Tokyo yeah. at least. Uh-huh. I, I think that they could end up making a lot more money as a mixed martial arts fighter if they showed up, uh, you know, on, on that scene with an Olympic medal in their hands. Yeah, I think the, that's right. You know, the, the promotional and the marketing aspect of that is much greater. And I think the earning potential is much greater with, with those credentials behind them. So my encouragement to my athletes is to stick with the sport, you know, that they're in right now. And we can make a decision later. I can, I can help, help facilitate that decision as well. You know, when a guy's, feels like it's time to transition. But uh, right now I'm, I'm building a team with a lot of young athletes. Uh, two of my national champions this year were both, one of them, one of them was 18 years old, one of them was wow. 19 years old. Um, one of those athletes won a world medal last year in the junior world competition. I suspect uh, there's a good chance both of those athletes could be on our junior and our senior world team next year. And And we've got a lot of other young, talented athletes out there. So it's, it's it's changing. I'm changing the, I don't know, just the landscape a little bit in, in the sport. I think a lot of traditionally what we saw was athletes that finished their collegiate careers made a transition into Greco-Roman or freestyle. Yeah. And for freestyle, it may make a little more sense because you're you're bent over and you're grabbing legs. Sure. It's it's a similar type of sport. But you know, the Europeans that we're competing against aren't wasting four or five years wrestling a different style if their goals are to win Olympic and world medals they're they're focused on on their sport of wrestling they're not wrestling yes. uh, an American only system of wrestling they're wrestling the, with the international rules whether yeah. it be Greco-Roman or freestyle yeah and you're talking- and so I think my my mission is to recruit and develop uh, you know some of the, the most mentally tough physically capable athletes yeah. And we can find in the United States and, and get them on the mats and, and represent the U.S. And when you and when you mentioned American only system, which you, what people who don't know who doesn't follow wrestling, you're talking about um, folk style wrestling, which is what people do in uh, college, NCAA college, uh, all throughout high school, and even the uh, kids programs. Uh, the main wrestling style is a folk style that only uh, I believe only America does. Correct. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's very unfortunate because because the system is, is great. You know, we have it within our schools. You know, we have athletes that that do combative sports within the school system, which is probably going to go away with with the way the culture is going now. People mm-hmm. don't want to see men be men and and do manly things like fight one another, um, and that, that's what wrestling is. It's a it's a form of fighting, just like jujitsu is a form of fighting. Um, or mixed martial arts is, you know, every form of fighting has their own rule set. But it, it's it's interesting that 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 still is is acceptable in in this country during this, you know, time. Um, but I think it's essential that that men learn how to fight and yeah. understand, you know, what they're made of. Well, um, I know we've had you on here a long time. I don't want to hold up any more of your day. I know you're a very busy man. So my very last question to you is, uh, Matt Linlin, have you submitted to the takeover? This is Matt the Lawn Linlin. I've submitted to the MMA takeover. Matt, we uh, we thank you for coming on. We really appreciate it. We ask that every, all our listeners support USA Wrestling. We wish you and your entire team luck. Uh, welcome to the MMA takeover family. Well, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. And you can follow my team at on the mat.com where we have our own USA Greco-Roman website which is uh, five point move the word not the number um, then you can follow me on Twitter Matt Lemon or, or Coach Matt Lemon on Facebook thanks a lot Keith and uh, keep up the good work